settle for the longer way. Zwei Flaschen Whisky für die Zeit. Und ich denke gern habe, du bist dabei. Mario geht fort, mal weg ist weit. Wann ich gehe, wann ich gehe. Ich werde die Fehler, wann ich gehe. Du sehst nicht mehr, was ich mach. Du sehst nicht mehr, wie ich lach. Ich werde die Fehler, du watch sehen. Hab krieg mein Zettel für den langen Weg. Du schenkst da aus mir für den Kahn. Es hat Barrio und Dale ganz wunderbar. Hass ich dir den weißen Dank. Wann ich geh, wann ich geh. Ich werd dir fehlen, wann ich geh. Du seh schnell, wie was ich mach. Du seh schnell, wie ich lach. Ich werd dir fehlen, du was ich seh. Well, 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 good over it, leave a light. Good evening, dear people. We are back for another episode of PA Dutch Live. It's the December episode. I got my Sandy Claus hat on. I am ready for the holiday season. Today was my last day of work for a Christmas break. Couldn't wait to get the kids out of the high school. Teachers couldn't wait to get out of the high school. And now I am on the relax mode for the next couple of days. Well, over break at least, but we have a wonderful show coming at you tonight. I am so excited to bring this episode to you. If this is your first time joining us, welcome, as we say in Pennsylvania Dutch. Welcome. I'm so glad that you decided to take some time out of your busy life this time of year to sit down and, and be with us. If you are a returning viewer, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy holiday schedule to be with us as well. I like to start every episode off the same way, whether you're watching us on the YouTube channel or if you're watching us on the Facebook page, to please, in the comment section, let me know where you are joining us from so I can give you guys some shout outs. And I got people coming on already. We got Draven Vlogs saying, hello, hello, Draven. Good to see you. Good to see you. You're taking some time out of your busy schedule to be with us tonight. We got our good friend Norman Jung staying up after midnight over there in the fatherland, says Steinbach, Germany, wide awake and waiting your broadcast. Well, Norman, I'm so glad that you are wide awake and with us. Carol, our dear friend and my distant cousin, good evening from the beautiful but chilly downtown Burnville. Are all the Christmas lights lit there in Burnville? I'm sure they are. Wayne is joining us from Oviedo, Florida, up and dressed. Well, that's good. Although, if you weren't dressed, I'd never know anyway, Wayne. Kathy is joining us. Good over at Elizabeth Town, Lancaster Condy. We're going to be talking a lot about Lancaster Condy tonight. We have S Mario by Mainz by Mainz. So we got another German staying up after midnight joining us from the beautiful city of Mainz. We got Donald Moyer joining us from Midlothian, Virginia. Don, thanks for joining us. We have Brigitte. Oh, Merry Christmas from Philadelphia. Holly Hickrishdog, Brigitte. It's so great to have you back with us this month. Lenore is joining us from Lakeland, Florida. We got our Pennsylvania Dutch snowbirds down there. Don South joining the show. We got Gary Weaver, Gouda dog from Egypt. That's Egypt, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, not uh, not where the pyramids are. Uh, we have German John 99, Grüß Gott von New Oxford, Pennsylvania. Well, Grüß Gott, mein Freund. We have Willie. Willie, I am a new subscriber from Florida. Uh, you were on a young German channel, and that's where I saw you. Willie, I know what you're talking about. A Feli from Germany. Yeah, that was great doing that a collaboration with her. I'm so glad you found the channel and you decided to join us tonight. Hopefully, we'll uh, be able to give you some good entertainment this evening. Carol says, everything's lit in Burnville. Is that including you too, Carol? We'll move on. Cadence Grieb says, hello. That's one of my high school students. Hey, Cadence. Cadence, Cadence. Enjoy the rest of your Christmas break. We have Dolly Moyer joins us every month. Merry Christmas from Fleetwood in beautiful Berks County. Dolly, I'll see you Christmas Eve at candlelight service at Becker St. Peter's. If you're there, I'll be there. And Dell is saying Merry Christmas from Fort Smith, Arkansas. Well, it's so great to have so many people from all over the place joining us. If you join late, of course, just send the message and I'll let you know. Hey, I got Christian Swartwood saying hello. That's another one of my German students. Oh, this is great. So glad you guys are joining us tonight. Ron Diddy Jr. from Wilkes-Barre, formerly Benderstedel, Elizabethville. Well, Duran, thanks for joining us this evening. So great to have so many people with us. We got an action-packed show for you tonight, and I want to jump right into it. We will, here in a little bit, be talking to my good friend, Craig Benner, who will be joining us uh, to talk all about... 
the Ephrata cloister. If that's something you really don't know too much about, maybe you heard of it, but you don't really know what it's all about. Well, lucky for you, you're going to learn a lot tonight. But first, I always like to start the, uh, oh, we got, wait, hold on, so there's, uh, we got Janice joining us from York. Janice, thanks for joining us. It's so great to have you on the show here. We got some stuff to, for your calendars as we move into the new year after Christmas. First and foremost, I advertised this last month, but I'd like to have everybody know. On Sunday, January 28th, so you still got some time, uh, will be the annual Grunsa Lodge for Junge or Groundhog Lodge for Youth. That will be at um, Midway Diner there in Bethel, Pennsylvania, right off of Route 78. That will be from 1 to 3 p.m. It's a free uh, event where you can take your children or grandchildren and learn about all things Pennsylvania Dutch. You'll do some Pennsylvania Dutch language stuff. There will be some special Groundhog guests to get everyone ready for Groundhog Day. So that's a great event to put on your calendar. We also, and this is big news, this is big. This broke this week. So as many of you know, here in Pennsylvania Dutch country, in the winter and going into the spring, we have a bunch of what are called groundhog lodges. And I did a whole episode on what they were a couple, uh, probably in the season one, back about two years ago. And uh, you can check that out to learn more. But for the last, for eternity, they have been a men only event. Well, that's changing, and this is great news in my opinion. We have uh, Grunsa Lodge Numa Ain't, so number one, Groundhog Lodge number one, which is on the Lehigh River, on the Lehigh, is having, this year they are now open to all, welcoming women and men. Lieber Grunsa Brido und Schwester, Groundhog Brothers and Sisters. Their event will be on Groundhog Day, February the 2nd. That will be at the Lehigh Masonic Lodge in Mukunji, Pennsylvania. I have the information here, but you can also find it online. You will need a ticket to go. The ticket will include your entrance to the event, the meal, and everything that goes along with a Groundhog Lodge. This is an opportunity for a lot of people that have never been able to go to go and experience this part of our culture, this really important part of our culture. This is a really group, a great group of guys that runs this organization, and I know you're going to have a good time. I've been a guest at this Grunsau Lodge multiple times, and I've always had a good evening with these gentlemen, and now it's going to be great because we're going to double the attendance right off the bat. So if you've ever been looking to go to a Groundhog Lodge, but you didn't know how or where, here's an opportunity. As other Groundhog Lodge events take place throughout the winter, I will advertise them on my channel as well and on my social media. But this is a great event, and I just want to tip my cap to the good brothers there, the Gouda Brida at the Grunsa Lodge, Noma Ains on the Lechal. Also, our good friends at Historic Schaeferstown will be having some, some exciting Pennsylvania Dutch stuff coming up throughout the winter. First and foremost, they will be bringing back their Pennsylvania Dutch classes where you can learn the language with our good friend Alice Spade as the instructor. That'll be taking place here, let me look, Saturdays from 9.30 to 11.30 a.m. And it's uh, through from January through April. It's $45 if you're a member, $50 if you're not. Uh, Alice does a really great job. It's also Tuesday Tuesday afternoons for maybe people that don't uh, work a nine to five job. So this information can all be found on Historic Schaeferstown's Facebook page and also their website. They also have some crafting classes, some uh, redware stuff going on, and some fracture and vinegar graining with instructor Lori Zimmerman. There's a lot of really cool stuff you can learn about Pennsylvania Dutch uh, folk art and our language through the good people at Historic Schaeferstown. I saw this picture just the other day and I want to share it. This is the heart of Pennsylvania Dutch country, and anyone that's from the area sees this picture knows exactly where it is. If you don't know, drum roll, brrr, it's Kosher Christmas Village just outside of Burnville. When Carol said Burnville was lit, she wasn't choking. And uh, if you've never been to this, it is an outdoor Christmas light spectacular, I guess we should say. You can check out their information online. It costs so much to drive through, but it is worth the trip if you've never seen it. It is. I don't know how many Christmas lights they set up, but I'll tell you what. It's a lot. <laughs> so if you find yourself in, in the greater Burnville area, or if you'd like to travel to the greater Burnville area, please check out Kozier's Christmas Village, and you will not be disappointed. Every month I do a hee-haw style salute to some town in Pennsylvania Dutch country, and I would be remiss if I didn't choose... Ephrata, Pennsylvania, for our salute. Ephrata, founded in 1732. The, the latest number I could find population-wise, 13,794 people or so, somewhere around there. But uh, we're going to learn all about this town of Ephrata here in a couple minutes and where it comes from and all this stuff here with the cloister. But that is our salute for this month to beautiful, the good people there in Ephrata, 
Pennsylvania in Lancaster County. All right, it's time. Without further ado, I need to bring on my good friend, Craig Benner, who will be talking to us all about the Ephrata Cloister. So let me pull this out. Let me pull Craig in. Craig, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Good. Craig, it's so great. Yeah, ich kann dich gut hören. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Craig, it's so great to have you on. Um, I always like to start each interview with just a real quick opportunity for you to tell the audience a little bit about yourself. Tell us, you know, where you were born, uh, growing up, and what's your? Do you have any Pennsylvania Dutch connection? Well, I was. Uh, I'm a native Pennsylvanian, born in Philadelphia. Uh, when you're young, you don't know what's going on in your family, and my father was looking for work. So we were in Lewistown, Pennsylvania for a, where, a year where I went to first grade. And we moved to Ephrata, Pennsylvania, where my father, got, he was into quality control with, with uh, fabrics. So he got a job at the W.W. Moyer factory in Ephrata. And we've been there ever since. And uh, just recently with what my brother has been doing on Ancestry.com, we found out uh, our Pennsylvania Dutch roots. Uh, we are part of those Germans that emigrated to America in the colonial time. And there's a little tiny village of which I know nothing called Mannheim, just southwest of Cologne. So it's a little tiny village. It's not the Mannheim that everyone knows about, but that's apparently where a, one of my Benner ancestors w- was from. So I don't know much more about it than that, but I am well, that's, definitely that's a, a duchy. But you've been a, you're a duchy. That's a, that's right. You are a duchy. Didn't even know. Um, well, yeah, right. Well, <laughs> that's great. So the topic tonight is Yefta Cloister. And before we, uh, well, I'll pull your presentation in. Uh, and everybody, I'm going to be Craig's slide advancer this month again, like I was last month for Lynn. Uh, Craig, you just tell me when to advance. But before we start, if somebody knew absolutely nothing about the effort of Cloister, maybe they heard about it. If you were to give like a 30 second elevator pitch, what would you say? The Everett Cloister is a perfect example of what William Penn had hoped for in his Commonwealth of Pennsylvania colony, where he had his holy experiment. Uh, I think also from what I've learned and read is that William Penn was also interested in having a place free of persecution. But we have a group of people here who came to Pennsylvania. They were Germans. They were seeking religious freedom. Uh, The leader ended up leaving to become a hermit, and they followed him here. And what we have today is what remains of that and the contributions they made to colonial America, Pennsylvania. They're actually, in many respects, a a true American story. It's a true American dream story, just not in the sense of making money. Well, now that's a perfect elevator pitch. So let's go beneath the waves a little bit and let's dig in to the history of the Ephrata Cloister. And uh, just so everybody knows, Craig didn't, he's not just making this stuff up. How many years have you been doing tours at the Cloister? Oh my, I've been involved for 51 years now. There you go, people. Yeah. I've Craig's been doing this a... longer. Craig's been doing this longer than I've been alive. So there we go. <laughs> Uh, I've been actually a volunteer there for a long time. I've also been a, an employee of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. It is a, owned by the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, and it is supported by a volunteer group called the Effort of Cloister Associates, of which I'm a member and a volunteer. And I also worked for them for a period of time. So okay. in this slide right here, it's one of my favorite pictures. Uh, except for the snow, you could see this right now at the Effort of Cloister where they put candles in the windows. And the building on the left is the 1741 Zal, which was their hall, their, their meeting house, basically. And then to the right, it was one of the dormitory buildings called the Zarin, Sarin, Saron. It comes from the um, Book of Solomon. Ich bin eine Lilie im Tal, eine Rose von Saron. I'm a lily in the valley, a, a rose of Sarin and Sharon in English. And that's the name they used for their building there where the sisters lived. We don't have the brother's house anymore. Go ahead, Doug. So... When we moved here in 17, or 1917, 63, 1963, uh, I was pretty young. And somewhere in the next, I, had, I don't know when, but somewhere in the next five or six years, my father took my brother and me down to visit it. And I just remember that I was absolutely blown away. Uh, in this picture here, you can see a tour in progress. And you can see the sister's house on the left and it's all to the right from the other angle. And then this view down here, I took this summer on the left side when I, I, I volunteer in the bakery. We don't bake there, but I volunteer and tell stories. Go ahead. I remember when I was a kid, I went down there, and this this covered stone stairway just freaked me out. And this is in the building where the bakery is. Uh, The building was made of stone for obvious reasons, and this stairway here just blew me away. And so it was one of my favorite places 
that I remember fondly when I went down there as a kid. The buildings and everything else freaked me out too, but the steps here was my favorite place. Go ahead, Doug. So how did I get involved? In the night, late 50s, uh, the Africa Cloister Associates, along with the Africa Cloister Chorus, under the direction of Dr. Russell Getz, produced a musical drama that featured the music of Africa as well as other aspects of a cloister life set against the backdrop of a field hospital after the Battle of Brandywine in 1777. Uh, the drama always started at dusk, and beforehand, junior guides, of which I was one, would ex give people an overview of the cloister, give them a tour, we were stationed in buildings, and we would talk to people, and then they would go to see the drama. I played several bit parts in the drama. Uh, on the left, we can see some of the sisters singing for George Ross, who was a Lancaster man who sung, signed uh, the Declaration of Independence. And on the right, we can see the main two characters of the story. Matthew Hale, obviously on the left, he was one of the soldiers that was being nursed to health. Uh, he was young and fair, as some of the sisters noticed. Uh, and Sister Anna, he and she and Matthew fall in love. And that's the main background of the story as they go through various aspects of Everett Floyd's life. So at the very end of the story, they are embracing, will she go with Matthew Hale? She wants to. But in the background, this loud voice says, Sister Anna. Carry fire, no fire in a wooden vessel, lest it burn thee. And I guess she figured that's what she was doing, and she didn't want to get burned. So Matthew leaves heartbroken, and she stays <laughs> at the cloister. And that was the end of the story. And it was very, very popular. Busloads of people came. It was, I think it was on for about 30 years. In any case, let's go to the next one. So when Doug looked at my PowerPoint, he said, what's up with this? Well, Keep in mind, we have an, an incredibly complex history, and I'm just trying to lay a little bit of background for what will lead to the effort of cloister. And if you think of Europe in, say, 1500, it was like a big stove, and there was just one pot on the stove, and that was the Catholic Church. And it was boiling and bubbling, and it was the main dish that you had to eat. Go ahead. So until 1517, when a Catholic monk turned the world on its head, and he didn't, I don't think he realized that what was going to happen. But what will happen after the Protestant Reformation, if you want to go to the next slide, all along there were other people in Europe who had their own recipes. They had their own pots that they wanted to get on the stove, but they couldn't get at it. And what we find is that suddenly people were able to get their pots on the stove and start cooking up things. Let's go to the next one and see one of those pots. So 10 years after Protestant Reformation in a Swiss town called Schleitheim, there are some people who are of a mind to be baptized as adults. We call them Anabaptists today. I like the German expression, Bida Teufer, someone who baptizes again. And this was published by a man named Michael Zattler. And basically, as you can see, uh, he, he writes this letter for the considering the unification of the many children of God. And in it, he has seven things, uh, adult baptism, practicing the ban, which was a, a disciplinary thing in, in the plain churches. Of course, how they looked upon the Eucharist. Uh, that they were separated from the world. They discussed leadership in the church, that they were shepherds. Non-resistance was a big thing and got them in trouble, and they also rejected the oaths. And within, I think, three months, Michael Sotler will be put to death for his efforts. But this will start a spark among a lot of, a lot of people. And uh, All right, go ahead. By the way, speaking of the Schleitheim Confession, I was talking to a Mennonite woman who was an English teacher in a local Mennonite school, and this is before the school year started, and they said they were having their staff meeting. And the, the principal or the superintendent said, what makes our Christian church different than other Christian churches in the, in the area? And I was shocked when she said that one of the teachers said the Schleitheim Confession. So it's amazing that they know what it is. Uh, there might be another confession that came in the 1600 that they might know better, but this is really what started it. So a few years later, we see a, a Dutch Catholic priest, Menno Simons, who joins uh, the Anabaptists. He's convinced. And you can probably guess where the Mennonites get their name, you know, but he was one of the early leaders. Uh, we have a 30-year war in there that's fought over religion. Uh, jumping up to 1683, we find the first Mennonites in Pennsylvania in Germantown. Ten years later, a gentleman, and there's, a, again, this is so much more complicated. We're giving a whirlwind tour here. Jacob Amon, who uh, steps away from the Mennonites. Uh, from him, we get the Amish. And then a few years later, uh, someone who's a church that's at least very common in this area we know is the Church of the Brethren. They were called the Neu Teufer or the New Baptist. 
uh, Alexander Mack and the Schwartz, or they also called the Schwartz Elm Brethren. So in 1719, some brethren emigrated to PA and Peter Becker was their leader. Go ahead. So here is Conrad Beisel's gravestone. I had to do this for Mr. Mama, Mamana. Mama, Mama, I, yeah, yeah. Anyway, Richard. This, this is for him. Uh, in any case, Conrad Beisel had a, early on, he was a, 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 an apprentice baker in, uh, he was born in Eberbach, Germany. And uh, he had a religious experience that he, he basically starts wandering around. He ends up in, in America and uh, he meets this Peter Becker and he becomes involved with the Church of the Brethren. And he will eventually become a pastor of one of the local congregations in the area, the Conestoga congregation, which still exists today. I'm not in the same place, but uh, he, uh, he becomes the pastor of that group. And uh, one of the things that Beisel set him aside was in the New Testament says, Jesus said, answers, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and spirit. At Ephrata, they were very interested in how the soul and the body could be transformed by faith. They were looking for, you know, this included all aspects of the physical life here on earth as a preparation for and an anticipation of that which would come when Christ returned and established an eternal Sabbath. We see another verse in Second Corinthians, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. What type of physical transformation might actually be possible? How can God be an experiential aspect of the relationship here on earth. So Beisel had his own recipe. He was in the brethren pot for a while. He had some other ingredients that he wanted. So he ends up leaving, as I may have mentioned before. Uh, the new creation that would come, basically he advocated celibacy and Sabbath worship. Uh, so he leaves and he wants to become a hermit on the banks of the Calico Creek here in Ephrata. This new creation that would come would become without, was without sex. It didn't eat, it didn't sleep. And with an eye to, as I already said, anticipating this and longing to appropriate this perhaps already in this life, the brothers and the sisters were celebrated at Ephrata, which is one of the things Beisel maintained. He actually called marriage was the prison of carnal man. Um, uh, they only ate one meal a day. God didn't eat. These new bodies wouldn't eat. They only slept six hours of night. a night. The new bodies wouldn't sleep. They were trying to practice it, so to speak, in the physical world. And that six hours of sleep was interrupted by a two-hour night watch service. They were expecting, just as it says in the New Testament, that Christ would return like a thief in the night, and that midnight might be the time when that would happen. Now, they chose not to eat meat as well. Again, meat is worldly and fleshly. There was a Swedish Lutheran minister who visited Ephrata in 1753. His name was Israel Kralius. He describes the meal that he had with the brothers as consisting of peeled barley in boiled milk into which bread was dipped, there was bread on the side for which they had butter, cheese curds, and pumpkin mush. And this, maybe not for the ingredients, but it sounds like a very typical German evening meal where you have bread and different toppings. Uh, he mentions that they used the pieces of bread to get every drop of the stew out of the bowls. They had utensils. They had a wooden spoon and a knife. When they were done eating, they had a pouch on their belts, and they would take a cloth out. They licked the spoon clean, wiped it off, wiped the knife off, and put it back in their pouches. That's my cleanup. That's my way of cleaning up after dinner. <laughs> so in discussing that diet with Acralis, he said the body is satisfied with but little. I would say that that diet is but little. And he also said that meat was not refused to anyone who wanted it, which is what Israel Acralis asked him about, which I think is interesting. So nowadays in our, our, our different ways of looking at life, I hear the term vegan being used to talk about effort of folks. And I can just tell you they were not vegan. They weren't even vegetarian. Their diet was vegetarian. Maybe we're splitting hairs there or whatever. So I think that the in, this is an excellent and interesting uh, um, description that we have here, and I, I hope you can see there. The word Ausgeburt, and I don't know if there are any of our German friends uh, who know this word, but in looking up the word Ausgeburt in a modern dictionary and even online, it's basically like a, a spawn of the devil, you know. But uh, I think... Uh, We'll look at a different definition of that word from the 1700s. So here rests a child, progeny of the love of God, freed some, which is peaceful. One who chose solitude, as we said, but later became a leader, an overseer, a teacher of the solitary and the body of Christ in and around Ephrata. 
Born in Averbach in the Palatinate, he was named Conrad Beisel. Passed away on the 6th of July, 1768. According to his spiritual life, he was 52 years old. But in his natural life, he was 72 years and four months. And they all died young back then, right? Yeah. All Just right. Real, while, so, while we're talking about, about yeah. Beisel, uh, this guy that would lead this 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 group, and I asked you this the other day, but I want you to tell the audience, it, we don't know for sure what he was like. I mean, there's there's people that have written about him, and we have that type of stuff. But from all of the stuff that you've read and, and having given all these tours, it how would you just – what kind of a guy do you think he was? It, I mean, he had to be – pretty good at what he did to get so many people to give up their lives to come live at Ephrata. Well, uh, if I had a time machine, I would go back because I would want to meet him in person. You know, uh, he is one person in the past that I would truly like to see. From what I've read, he has his detractors. Uh, there were people in the community that didn't like him. Uh, and then there were people that were, I hate to use this word, but they were like Bicel groupians. They called him, you know, uh, he was a strong, charismatic personality. He was very well read, and he was able to preach. Uh, Israel Kralius, I won't go into it, he does describe the, a, a service on a, on a Saturday morning with Beitzel leading it. It's the only in-person description we have of his experience in the church service. Uh, I think he, uh, as I said, he was a charismatic leader. I think he was also perhaps uh, pretty proud. He was the leader, and he wanted you to know it. One story yeah. that I've always heard was that uh, uh, Count Sinzendorf, he was supposed to meet with Beisel. And uh, since he was a count, he was, uh, from all stories that I've heard, proud of being a count in his nobility. And Beisel was just as proud of his lowly estate. So they never got together. You know, is that the, that's the story that I've heard. And it's just interesting. I've often wondered, I think a lot about what he was like, but he was definitely the leader. He was in charge. You know, you had to pass things by him. Uh but we also see that the sisters in particular had a level of autonomy uh, over their own lives on a daily basis that was unknown in colonial America at the time, and certainly not in Europe. So why he did this, I've been reading up on that. I couldn't give you an answer. But nonetheless, the sisters did experience a level of autonomy and independence that was unknown and unheard of. And also because they weren't married and producing children, they had a lot of freedom besides doing the things throughout the day they needed to live. Uh, but they were able to produce different things, which we'll see. Go ahead. All right. So if you look up the word cloister in the dictionary, you're going to find that it's a, a covered walkway in a monastery and a, or a nunnery. It joins the worldly buildings that are open to the outside to the inner buildings, which are open to the group. Uh, and obviously, when we think of a cloister, we think of a monastery or a nunnery. But it is a word that was never used by the residents of the effort of cloister. As a matter of fact, in the very beginning, they used the expression das Lager der Einsamen. Uh, the camp of the solitary, which is certainly that. And you can see in one of the texts here, the word Gemeinschaft, basically the community. And so that was common. And cloister will come later, and specifically it will come to reflect the historic site, which the Commonwealth owns now. But I think that's interesting. I like das Lager der Einsamen. Yeah. All right. So one of the things that Effort is known for is music. Um in the Chronicon, which was a history written after Beisel's death about the site, uh, there's a quote that said, this wonderful harmony, and that word there, I don't know how much you know, uh, Doug, but the harmony was not very common in colonial America, that people would sing in harmony. Uh, but this wonderful harmony resounded over the country. Whoever heard of it wished to see it, and whoever saw it acknowledged that God truly lived among these people. And that was from 1786. So over 1,000 hymns were composed at Ephrata. It makes it a music center, a publishing center of hymns. And while the cloister published numerous hymnals, I just want to highlight three of them. The very first one, which you can see on the left in that picture there, is called Vorspiel der Neuen Welt. And that's actually the rest of the title of the Vorspiel musical drama, which means prelude to the new world. And that expression right there is what they looked at their life at Ephrata as. It was a prelude to what was coming when Christ returned. They were anticipating it. They were acknowledging it. They wanted it. They were desiring it. So this was printed by Benjamin Franklin in 1732. So they were well acquainted with Benjamin Franklin. Uh, in 1739, Christopher Sauer, who was the first German press in the American colonies, uh, will publish the Zionitische Weihrauchsbügel, the Zionitic Hill of Incense. Or, and uh, it included some of Conrad Beisel's earliest compositions, 
Sauer printed 1,500 copies. So obviously he was looking to sell these, which is very interesting to other Protestant denominations in Pennsylvania. And then later on, the Torta Talba was the first collection containing in 1747 only works by effort of writers. And it was printed on the press of the Brotherhood, which we'll talk about a little bit later. This contained a preface with Beisel's instructions on singing and writing, making it the very first published treatise on harmony and music in America. Many visitors came to Ephrata to hear the singing, and they noted that they did sing in harmony, which was unusual for the time, as I said. The music was described as ethereal, otherworldly, music for the soul and not the ear, that it was far above ordinary church singing. It was told at Ephrata that the angels themselves at the birth of Christ used their rules for singing. And if you uh, didn't learn the, the rules for singing at Ephrata, you're going to have to learn them later when you get to heaven. So you might as well learn them in this life is what they felt. Now, in my own experience, I don't know if I was ever transported when I hear Ephrata music, but there was a musicologist by the name of Lucy Carroll. I want to say this was in the 90s. And there was a day of music. And she was one of the early people uh, to actually explore Ephrata music. She was extremely knowledgeable. And she had a chorus with her that day of very talented student singers in her I guess it was high school. I'm not really sure. But she said, you know, and I'm not a musician. You might have, but apparently the way the music is written, it's not made designed for how we sing music today. So she sang a cloister hymn the way we would sing it today. And then she and her group sang a hymn. And I'm already getting goosebumps just thinking about it. She sang it is the best way that she could possibly imagine how it was sung back then. And I was... I was not transformed or transported, but it was like an amazing experience that I will never forget. Because music was something that was ignored for so long in, in the 50s, a, a man by the name of Russell Guest founded a chorus to interpret Ephrata music. So music is today a very big part of the experience of Ephrata, uh, and, and rightly so. Um, a couple of years back, a young man by the name of Dylan Christian Herbert was looking in the um, Ephrata Codex, which is in the Library of Congress, and it's a bunch of hymns. And if you can see that PA historical marker right there, uh, it might be hard to read, but he noticed that there were the names of three sisters on some of the hymns. So why in a society of, like Ephrata? But these are recognized as some of the first and earliest female composers of music in the American colonies. So that's an amazing thing. He came out with some new hymns that have never been sung before and created a CD called Voices in the Wilderness. Uh, so again, all a cappella. They didn't use any musical instruments at Ephrata. Beisel felt that there was nothing adequate to praise God than the human voice. And he said that the voice was like a horse, a wild horse. You had to break a horse to ride it. You had to break the human voice to be able to praise God adequately. So uh, it must have been very strenuous to learn to sing the way Beisel wanted to. Anyway. So fraktor is a German word for like, uh, you could have a, a leg fraktor or an arm fraktor. It's basically the word for broken or, or fractured as it's a, one of those cognates. Uh, but if you look at the writing here, it also refers to an ornamental style of writing. And it's nothing unique to Ephrata. Uh, but if you look at like in the, on the right side there, you might be able to see the A. Uh, the second letter at the top is a B and then a C. But look at all the different strokes that are used to create one letter and they're not connected. So in a sense, it's a fractured or broken writing. And this is one of my favorite Fraktor pieces. This was in a book that they wrote with samples of letters that people could use for inspiration. But it says, the Christian ABC is suffering, patience, and hope. Who has learned these has reached his goal or hit his goal. Kind of amazing. And there we have a sister working on Fraktor in the sister's house. Go ahead. Okay, so this was considered an act of worship, an act of discipline. They were trusting God to try to figure out how to, to decorate it and all that. And this is one of numerous wall placards that you can see. Uh, we have 13 of them currently at Ephrata. Certain descriptions of the 1700s said that the walls were covered with them, and many of them were given away as gifts. But this is one I just absolutely love. It is located currently, a reproduction in this all, and whenever I give a tour there, I I give a German lesson and it involves this. So Doug, you know, and I'm sure your students know as well that German nouns are always capitalized. Uh, the first letter is capitalized regardless of its position in a sentence. So if you look at this piece right here, you can, even if you don't know what you're looking at it, you can see that in the first two lines, there's a whole bunch 
of capital letters. And if you look at the second line, uh, we have the word DAS, which to me stands out, but I've looked at it so many times. And then after the word DAS, we have the word Koisha. And I love this sister. She did this around 1750. Uh, we have a K. I know it's kind of lost and all that. There's an E, there's a U. The S is pretty easy. But then look what happened. She didn't measure twice and cut once. She ran out of room. She didn't plan ahead. So she squeezed in the smaller case letters to finish off the German word Koisha. Let's go to the next slide and see what this all is. So the entire phrase is Gott und das Koisha, and you can see I've done it the way she did it. La muss stetig in uns walten und uns in Ewigkeit nicht lassen mehr erkalten. I find it interesting in a lot of Fraktor pieces from this time period that you might find grammatical errors. We'd have a singular noun with a plural subject. Um, oftentimes, uh, if there is a double letter, like an L-A-M-M, they did have it in this one. But if they're running out of room, like in a verb like common, they'll put a, a macron is what it's called over the letter to indicate that it's a double letter. So there's a kind of like a sh shortcut or a, uh, you know, whatever. And also when there is an umlaut, they often will see that it's a little e instead of the two dots. But this is a perfect example of effort of frock or God and the chaste lamb must continually in us rule and us in eternity not let more grow cool down. So that's just a word for word, pretty much translation. But typical of the type of sentiment that we might find. Uh, and again, as I said, the spelling was oftentimes a free for all. And you know, in German, as you know, Doug, and your students know, grammar is a big key to meaning. And if that grammar is missing, you're kind of guessing sometimes. So, all right, let's go to the next one. All right, this is one of my favorite and uh, uh, frock tour pieces. It's part of a music book. It's called a Granaten Apfel in German or a pomegranate in English. And you'll notice there's three pomegranates. And if you use your imagination, you can see there's two circles that intersect. And the story I heard, and there are there may be all kinds of things that people see in this imagery and what they meant by it, but the story that I heard that I like is that we find these two circles intersecting. The one is the kingdom of God. The other one is the kingdom of Satan. And where they intersect is where man finds himself. And he has no idea from day to day which kingdom will have sway over his life. And obviously you want to be open to the kingdom of God. But I just think this is amazing. And it's just an amazing piece of frock tour. And there you can see uh, one of the things that Akrela is, the, our Swedish Lutheran guy, the younger sisters are mostly employed in drawing. Yeah, so just to, you know, to clarify, so these people were living here, these brothers and these sisters at the cloister. And besides doing all the things that they needed to do to, to survive, like baking bread and, and working the ground, I'm sure, to raise crops and so forth, they were also then producing all of this other stuff that you're talking about, like like frock tour art and, and music. And it was like a full community in every within respect. itself. Yeah. In every respect. And after the Battle of Brandywine, they were nursing soldiers uh, in a makeshift field hospital in one of the buildings. Um, the other thing to note is that their daily schedule reflected a balance between the work that they needed to do and also prayer. They would get up at five in the morning for an hour of prayer, meditation, study. They would work from six to nine. They would have another prayer break for an hour. Uh, they would work then till noon. At certain times uh, of the history of the cloister, they actually had a service at noon, but they had another break. They would work till three, another break. They would work till five. They would get together at, at five to cook the one meal of the day. And I think it's interesting. Uh, it, it does say that at the nine o'clock prayer break, bread could be taken if needed. I love that if needed part. It would have been if needed for me. But then after the class, after the dinner was eaten, and the sisters either ate together on their individual floors or got together as in the entire dorm. I don't really know. But basically, they had classes in singing and writing. And uh, I might get to it later, so I'll repeat myself. But it's interesting. It says those who are not skilled at singing were encouraged to learn to write. So I would have been doing a lot of writing. you know. In any case, that's one of my favorites. Okay, another thing that was a great contribution to Pennsylvania culture, colonial culture, was that we have a printing press and also a publishing house at Ephrata. In the very beginning, in, in uh, the early 1740s, they had a paper mill that was established at Ephrata on the banks of Calico Creek. This is thought to be the fourth paper mill in Pennsylvania and possibly the seventh in the colonies. So uh, in any case, we mentioned the word fractor before. Fractor also refers to a Gothic or black letter typeface that you can see there, the 
comparison between them. The, the Germans and many people in Northern Europe at the time preferred this. And uh, even though Benjamin Franklin was a competitor for printing with the Germans, uh, you know, he, he doesn't uh, buy this type font. And so uh, sometime in 1745, a German printing press and a, a typeset arrived at effort, which created the second German press in the colonies after Christopher Sauer, who opened his Germantown printing office in 1738. So let's get to the doozy of it all. All right, this is the mother of all printing things. And by the way, if you'll notice in the lower left, we have the effort of watermark. So the Martyr's Mirror is a history of the deaths of Christian martyrs from the time of Christ until 1660. And it was printed in the Holland Dutch language, okay? So there were some German-speaking Mennonites in the early 1740s, thereabout, in Montgomery County, PA. They sought to have a German translation. They actually corresponded with the folks in Holland. And the folks in Holland said, look, there's no way we're going to translate this book. It, it's got over a 1,000 pages. Um, we're not gonna, why don't you just pick out some of your favorite stories and go with that? You know, well, they weren't happy with this. They wanted the whole thing from the time of Christ until the Anabaptist martyrs up to 1660. So they decided to come uh, to Ephrata. And Peter Miller, who was the second leader at Ephrata, he went to the University of Heidelberg. He spoke numerous languages. He translated the Martyr's Mirror from Dutch into German. And then starting in 1748, 15 men worked on the project, 15 brothers, six of whom were making the paper. 1,300 copies were printed. I just recently found out that they must have run out of paper because they've noticed on some of the pages there's like a French uh, watermark on some of the paper that they use. So they must have had to buy paper elsewhere to finish them. Um, now, I saw a presentation at the uh, about the Martyr's Mirror at the Lancaster Mennonite Historical Society. And one of the things I've always wondered about, and I guess never wondered about enough to ask, but I wondered, what does the word mirror in the title, the Martyr's Mirror? And I was told by the presenter there that there were two things. Back in this time, if the word mirror was part of the title, it was understood that it was an instructional text. And that's what these Mennonites, their children had not experienced persecution, not here in Pennsylvania. As a matter of fact, they stopped putting people to death for being an Anabaptist, I think sometime in the, I don't know, early 1600s. There's a, there is a date where they stopped killing people, but they were still persecuted. Uh, so this was an instructional book, and they wanted their children to understand what their ancestors had gone through to maintain their faith, and that maybe it will become necessary in Pennsylvania. Of course, we don't have many problems that I'm aware of. All right. The other thing is that the mirror represented a reflection of the heart of the martyrs, which I find also quite amazing. All right, let's go to the next one. So one of my things, when I was in high school, we were part of a group called the Pennsylvania Federation of Junior Historians. And we actually did an archaeological dig and we supposedly found what's known as the Peter Miller cabin, where Peter Miller lived. But uh, from 1993 to 2001, there was an archaeological field school that was conducted around the pro Cloister property as a public-private enterprise partnership between the Pennsylvania Historical Museum Commission, which owns the site, and Elizabethtown College. So in July 1995, a most unique artifact was found. Several theories were initially suggested, but it was definitely determined to be what is called a natural glass Baroque trumpet. And this type of trumpet is truly rare, and it is unlikely you will see anything like this anywhere else in North America, and it is currently on display in the Visitor's Center uh, at the Ephrata Cloister, which you can see then. And, you know, why is it there? Well, there are some ideas, but a story that I heard when I was in high school, and look how deep that is. I mean, that looks like at least three feet, maybe more, uh, probably three feet. But nonetheless, one of the stories I heard was that a representative of the King of England came to visit the Ephrata Cloister at some time and gave Peter Miller, who often was the one that received guests, uh, a gift. And so Peter Miller takes it to Beisel, and Beisel says, no way, that's way too worldly, go out and bury it. And that is the absolute first thing I thought of when I saw it. I took this picture here, so I, they, they called me down to see it. Uh, and it is absolutely an amazing, unique piece. It gives us more questions than answers, unfortunately. But still, it's an amazing thing to think about. How did it get there? What was it for? People were questioning with it, if it could actually be played. We see many things in the cloister, frock tour pieces where there's angels with the final trumpet blowing when Christ returns. So who knows? But for some reason, it ended up, it looked like it was just laid there in the natural setting of the earth that you can see in the middle, it's broken. And the mouthpiece, if there was one, was, is missing. But if you get to Africa, make sure you see that. 
All right, let's go on. So the name Ephrata, uh, it's actually uh, appears several times in the Old Testament uh, of the Bible, and it is an ancient name for Bethlehem. And uh, in Genesis 34, you read the story about how Rachel died in childbirth at Ephrata. And this imagery of birth and death was one of the reasons why Ephrata chose to use this name. But we also find, and the thing I love, I found this in an 1821 Swiss Bible. Uh, and this is in the book of Micah, chapter 5. And it says, Und du Bethlehem Ephrata. And it is spelled exactly how we spell it. Because many times different versions have an extra H in the end or whatever, you know. But the fact that it's spelled exactly how we saw it today, I, I just had to take a picture of it. But it's part of a messianic prophecy, you know, because Christ was born in, in uh, Bethlehem Ephrata. Uh, so I just think it's a wonderful name. And it, it's where I live and it's my home. All right, we're starting to wrap this up, but I need to talk about the present time. Uh, as I said before, there is a group of volunteers at the Effort of Cloister called the Effort of Cloister Associates. I've been a member for many years. I've been a volunteer for the Effort of Cloister Associates. Uh, if you look on the left, one of the best programs we have that I like the most is Lantern Tours. And uh, if you knew Michael Showater, who passed away earlier this year, what a great loss. He wrote the script, Picking Things from Effort of Cloister History that you might not hear in a regular tour. And using his students as actors, they learn the script and uh, they present a tour where you go from site to site to site and you get a whole story of different vignettes. And this year we're looking at uh, TripAdvisor 1750 style. What did people write about Ephrata when they went on to TripAdvisor after their visit? So uh, I will say this, if this in any way entices you to go, he who hesitates is lost. You should go to the Ephrata Cloister website and uh, buy tickets online. It is well worth it. It's a wonderful uh, program. It's one of my favorite things. And these kids do a great job. And it, it just it, it does my heart good to see children, uh, young people doing the same thing as I did when I was in high school, who are carrying on the tradition. We didn't do tours like this, but nonetheless, there's still young people who are interested in history. So I mentioned the musical drama before, Forspiel. If you look in the picture on the right where it says revitalize, uh, the Effort of Cloister Chorus performed this pageant of cloister music called the Forspiel. As it grew in popularity, it was recognized that a formal performance space was needed. In 1963, an amphitheater was constructed on the eastern side of the property, and this amphitheater is what you're seeing here. Uh, when I was there in high school, those are three-dimensional buildings representing the sarin and the salt, but we just had like a flat like you might see in a typical high school setting. They were just flats. And I remember before I was going to Germany in 1973, I needed money. And so they hired me to paint some of the chipped away spots on this flat. So this is much nicer. And a lot of people think that there are actually buildings. Uh, they installed wooden benches and a stage was recreating, created with this flat of the set saw so on the siren. So the last performance of the Forest Field was presented the summer of 1989. But this amphitheater remained and it was continued. They continued to use it as a wedding venue. A, a lovely wedding venue. And one of the things I didn't mention is that besides the Sullivan brothers and sisters, there were a group of married people. And uh, when Beisel dies in 1768, Peter Miller is quoted as saying that, you know, we, we shall have no people join us. Our way of life is not the way of the what will become out of the colonies at the time. And I'm doing a terrible job saying that. But he recognized that what they were doing was going to die. And in 1813, the last celibate member dies and the married people incorporate the Seventh-day German Baptist Church, and they will continue worshiping there until 1934. And I often joke with visitors, had the married people not been included, considering that the last celibate died in 1813, the African cloister might be a Walmart or some type of a, a shopping center instead of an amazingly beautiful uh, historic site out of Pennsylvania history and American history. So they used this venue for weddings and other things, mostly weddings. COVID closed the site. The space saw several renovations over the years, but eventually it fell into disrepair and sat idle. In 2020, the, the board of the Effort of Cloister Associates took another look at the space. They saw the potential for a revival that lay hidden beneath the weeds and began to explore the possibilities. In 2021, the revitalization project began in earnest, spurred on by a $100,000 anonymous donation uh, who happens to see the, the person sees the profound potential and community benefit in bringing back this corner of the historic property of life as a venue, as we said, for special events, concerts, 
theatrical productions and educational programs, as well as a space for community engagement and celebration of life's events. So this will involve no state money. So this revitalization, everything that they're doing here has to be with private funds. So this revitalize is a, a program to raise money to accomplish this. Sue Fisher is the spearhead in this. She is the president of the African Coalition Associates Board. So if you go to the next uh, slide, you can see her contact information. If any of these events look interesting to you, either they should see the candlelight tours, or if you have a bunch of money laying around and this sounds like a good thing to donate to, then contact Sue Fisher. Uh, you can see the number there and uh, the effort of Cloyster email is a generic email, but she will get it uh, as you can see there. And so um, this is a- Yeah, and, 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 and Craig, as, as you know, and I'll just let everybody else know, if you are interested in learning more about the effort of Cloyster, they have a very active presence on social media. Uh, yes. Of course, you can visit their website, effortofcloyster.org, but um, they are also on Facebook and Instagram. Yep. And I highly recommend you guys to give them a follow uh, because then they'll post anytime there's special events going on, uh, like these candlelight tours. But I mean, I've been to the Cloyster many times and did the regular tour that's offered throughout any time of the year. And it is well worth it is absolutely well worth it. I mean, we, you, you got the story tonight from Craig, but there's to actually walk in these rooms and to see where the sisters slept and where they worshiped. It's, it's a completely different um, experience than, of course, just looking at photos. Uh, so and they do have concerts from time to time at the cloister, singing some of this original choral music. I've had the opportunity to sing some of these choral pieces as well. And it is it's not, it's like Craig said, it's not what we're used to hearing. The types right. of harmonies that they wrote are different but they're different in a way that is 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 so pleasant to the ear that i could understand why people could have transcendental experiences <laughs> listening to the music but seriously seriously um it, it's just wonderful wonderful stuff so craig i can't thank you enough for um coming and talking to us i just want to share one comment from somebody that's watching dolly says this is great thanks mr benner for an excellent lesson may we all be blessed with bread to sop up that last bit of stew is it that's a that's a that's like, you can't can't beat that i agree molly i agree uh, dolly so much with that comment but craig thank you so much for your work over the years for telling this story for continuing to tell this story because it is so unique to the america to the american story absolutely. Uh, that we it had is this an american kind of like, story too absolutely you know i, I just want to thank you for the work and of course the people at effort that are making all of this happen and continue to make this happen please people if you get a chance make this one of your new year's resolutions Go visit the Ephrata Cloister. There's a lot of things to do in that area too. You can make a whole day of it, um, but you will not be you will not be sorry that you that you went 100. And Doug, if I might say, it doesn't show up too well, but I got your shirt on here. I see. Punched a mukafana. Yeah. So I wore that for you tonight. But it well, I appreciate well. that, Craig. I appreciate that. It's a Thank nice so shirt much, too. It is a nice shirt, Gal. It'll be a conversation piece. That's what we hope. That's what we hope. <laughs> Thank you for agreeing to come on. Uh, uh, you are a wealth I of knowledge. I, I appreciate your friendship, and I look forward to you know future collaborations with you. And uh, maybe do. we'll have you on the show again because you know a lot more than just effort of cloister stuff. So we'll be well, in touch, Craig. But I want to wish you and your family. It. Thanks for joining. Oh, very much so. I wish you and your family a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And to we'll you talk and to everyone you. else, too. Thank you, Doug. <laughs> Thank you, Craig. People, 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 you can't beat that. What a wonderful presentation. That guy knows his stuff. But we have a couple other things to figure out here before we leave for the month. Just really quickly, let me go through a couple things. Every month we have something Pennsylvania Dutch language related. Now, we did see some effort of cloister art using language, but I want something specifically Pennsylvania Dutch. And it is the time of Christmas and the Pelschnickel. So I chose uh, this month uh, to share with all of you a poem by one of my favorite favorite Pennsylvania Dutch poets, and that is John Bermelin, who lived from 1873 to 1950. And this is his poem, Der If you can read Pennsylvania Dutch and understand it, that's what I'm going to be reading on the left-hand side, but I, of course, have the English translation there on the right-hand side. So let's listen to a little bit of Pennsylvania Dutch poetry, my dear friends. Here we go. Der Belschnickel from John Bermelin. Am Grishtag do kommt als der Belschnickel bei, was sind doch die Kinder so froh? Ma schickt sie ins Bett, dann schlofe sie ei. Und Marriott, do war a schon do. Na one mol der Belschnickel epa vergesst, sel he sich mol gor net so she. Des war wieder eins von der Orme gewest. O oh ja, sel kann ma verstehe. Ken schu an de fies, ken kohle im Haas, 
und hen o schier gar nix zu leben. Der Winter ist hart, das findet mir wohl aus. Die Orme, die kummer der Neber. Grischkindel ist kummer, wo selber so arm. Sei Bett wo im Stahl auf dem Stroh. Es bringt uns der Friede, uns hat's war dem Warm, was viele die Menschen so froh. Und weisch du von Orme, so steh nicht doch bei. Es hat jo so viel in der Welt. Dann geht das Grischkindel an dir net vorbei. Es bringt dir mehr Glück wie dein Geld. Tough to beat old John Bermelin. He's one of the masters, one of the absolute masters. Dear friends, I think uh, we're running a little long tonight, so I'm going to skip over our song. But I would invite you, if you subscribe to the YouTube channel, this year I came up with a brand new Pennsylvania Dutch version of the 12 Days of Christmas. If you search Pennsylvania Dutch 12 Days of Christmas, you're going to come to this video. I'll also put a link on, I have it on our on our PA Dutch 101 Facebook page. Um, check that song out. Uh, all of the art that was drawn uh, was done by a student of mine. I want to give Reed Loophold a shout out. Uh, he did wonderful work on the drawings of the various gifts that you get on the 12 days of Christmas. So please, if you get a chance, check that song out. It'll put you in the Christmas mood, but in the Pennsylvania Dutch Christmas mood. And as Craig reminded us, we do have clothes for sale. In fact, we've got two new uh, items. Rachel and I have been working uh, and we have, I showed you the, Elbedrich one on the left there last month, but since then we added the Schnickelfritz shirt. So many people grew up getting called Schnickelfritz by their grandparents or by their parents, so we decided we have to have a shirt with that word on it. So if you are interested in getting Elys, it's a little too late for Christmas gifts, but for birthday gifts throughout the new year, of course, please feel free to visit our website, and I'll give you the link here in a minute, but you see some of our fans out there wearing our material. We got our Mox Good t-shirt and our Duna Vera and ay 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 no all and a lot of other things and don't forget it doesn't have to be clothes it can also be in the form of stickers or tote bags or hoodies it, 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 there's a lot of things available so check out zazzle.com backslash pa dutch stuff for all of your pa dutch merchandise needs uh, and uh, we will keep that new new ideas coming in the new year but we got tons of stuff on there please head on over and check it out if you would like to financially support what we do here at the channel, please check out buymeacoffee.com backslash Doug Mainford. All money raised will go towards the upkeep of the channel, whether that's buying new uh, new equipment, uh, helping pay the internet bill, things like that. We really appreciate it. I want to give a shout out to some people that this past month have supported the channel financially. Alan Moyer, Seth Moak, Gary Johansson, and Randy Hobeter. I really appreciate your financial support. And if you don't want to give us any money, that's fine too. We're going to keep the, the channel going. We're going to have lots of great Pennsylvania Dutch content throughout the new year. That's the goal. New episodes of PA Dutch Live. In fact, mark your calendars right now because our next episode of PA Dutch live will be on wednesday january the 17th 2024 at 6 p.m right here on the youtube channel and over on facebook and on twitter as well well what was used to be called twitter next month i'll be welcoming a really special guest uh who is a good friend of mine former colleague abigail schrack she'll be talking about this doesn't sound exciting but we're going to make it exciting all things flax uh for our colonial ancestors Flax was a really important part of their lives, and you would be surprised at how much this plant would be used. Uh, and Abigail Abby is uh, an, uh, an expert in fibers, and particularly she's going to talk about flax. And we're going to learn how our ancestors dealt with this funny plant and what they all were able to do with it. It's truly unbelievable. We have no idea how easy we have it these days. But as we're reaching the end uh, of the show, I would just like to thank all of you again for spending another year with me here at the YouTube channel and over on the Facebook page and on the Instagram and all that stuff and social media. We had a great year. We increased our subscriber numbers. We had another awesome year of 12 great episodes of PA Dutch Live. I look forward to bringing that type of content and material to you all throughout the new year as well. I love your comments. I love the support that you show me. And I I can't thank you enough for that. And as we you know, go into this end of the year here and into the new year, whatever you celebrate over the next couple of days, I hope that those events are filled with joy and blessings. And I hope that the new year brings you prosperity and good health and happiness. And I'd like to close by wishing you these two phrases in our Pennsylvania Dutch language. Hallige Grishdog, Merry Christmas. And Hallige Snijor, Happy New Year. 
And until next month, dear friends, on the 17th, when I can't wait to be with all of you again, we always close the same way. As we do in Pennsylvania Dutch, we always say, say it with me. Mox Goot, dear friends. I'll see you next year. Mox Goot, so dear. Mox Goot, so dear. Mox Goot, so dear for now. Unsere Zeit ist all und so es ist Mox Goot for now. Hoff wieder mit dir zu Zeit. Hoff du bringst er Rick and Fry. Mox Goot zu dir, Mox Goot zu dir, Mox Goot zu dir for now. Unsere Zeit ist all und so es ist Mox Goot for now. Hoff wieder mit dir zu Zeit. Hoff du bringst er Rick and Fry. Und so Mox Goot. Box good, Lima, Frein, Box good.